I will praise you to the heights, my God, the King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is beyond all searching out. Each generation will praise your works to the next and proclaim your mighty acts. I will meditate on the, of the glorious splendor of your majesty and on the story of your wonders. People will speak of your awesome power and I will tell of your great deeds. They will gush forth the fame of your abounding goodness and they will sing of your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger and great in grace. The Lord is good to all. His compassion rests on all the creatures. All your creatures will thank you, Lord, and your faithful servants will bless you. They will speak of the glory of your kingship, and they will tell about your might to let everyone know of your mighty acts and the glorious majesty of your kingship. Your kingship is an everlasting kingship. Your reign continues through all generations. God is our king. The Lord supports all who fall and lifts up all who are bent over. The eyes of all are looking to you. You give them their food at the right time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, full of grace in all he does. The Lord is close to all who call on him, to all who sincerely call on him. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries and saves them. The Lord protects all who love him, but all the wicked he destroys. My mouth, our mouths, will proclaim the praise of the Lord. All people will bless his holy name forever and ever. And the congregation together says, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here, here for you. We are here for you. Let our breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. We are here for you. You are hearts are open, nothing near is hidden. You are our one design. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, you try to fall down. Let our hearts be your hands.
welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, we welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, we welcome in this place. Let every heart adore, let every soul awake. Almighty God of love, we welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, we welcome in this place. Holy ground 
And I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing in His presence on hope. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us pray. Standing in His presence on holy ground, I love You, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship You. My soul, rejoice, rejoice, take joy, joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your guys out there if we have any visitors just want to say welcome we're glad you're here and uh, yes um, just two announcements pretty basic um, pray for Stephanie she's nearing her birthing time I know she's getting anxious so pray for Stephanie in the next two weeks um, she's also gonna have a baby shower this Saturday uh, from 10 to noon um, anybody's welcome to come uh, diapers would be appreciated, size two or bigger. You know, diapers prices have gone way high. <clears throat> and uh, also, the big thing is uh, next Saturday at two o'clock, Laura Gartner, who is the pastor over at Austin First Baptist Church, is going to be ordained. It's a long process. She's been working really hard to get there. 
And so our church and Austin are going to join together and go through an ordination service, and that's next Saturday, 2 o'clock, with refreshments to follow. And so I hope you can come out and support her and just let her know that uh, we, we just agree that God has chosen her. So this is the first Sunday after Easter. He's alive. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Our Jesus is not dead. He's not in the tomb, and they never found his body. Hallelujah. <laughs> Have a great Sunday. <laughs> I'll take it. Hey, last Sunday was a lot of fun. It was like, where'd all those people go that were up front and were singing, leading us in worship? I only see two of them this week. It's just like a tenth of what we had last week that was up front. Uh, not ready to go yet, but you can stand, you can stand ready. Uh, I, we also did some baptisms in some cold water, and so I'd like to invite Haley Mallet to come forward. Katie Redden, would you come forward? Uh, is Mary Wilson in the house today? Come on, Mary, come on down. And Bonnie Graham. Bonnie, where are you? Come on, you come stand by me. It's all right, Katie. All right. Do you remember last Sunday? Yeah. Uh, how was the water? Cold. Oh, okay. Uh, aren't you glad you just do that one time? Okay. How are you doing? Good. You are. Well, good. Great to have you come forward. We have your baptismal certificates. Bonnie, I'll give that to you. Haley, there's yours. Katie, there's yours. And Miss Mary, here's yours as well. Yes. And so, yeah, we give them a hand. We praise God. You know, our, our work just begins as we baptize when we follow up and we help you each one grow in the Lord. And so uh, you can't get rid of us at this church. You know, we kind of grow on you like mold or different things. But no, hopefully through the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, we all grow together to be one in Christ. But uh, thank you for submitting yourselves to Jesus to be baptized. And I hope you will frame or hold this up. But that's just the beginning, the first step. And we'll take more steps after that, all right? All right. Okay, God bless you each one. Each month we have an emphasis on a mission that we spotlight or missions that we spotlight or missionaries that we spotlight. This month of April, we are spotlighting missionaries, uh, two good friends of our church and Vicki is mine, Rick and Ida Gutierrez. They are in South Africa, uh, but they've also been used in the Ukraine when the war broke out there with Russia and they've been utilized in other parts of the world. Uh, they come to Colorado because Anita's parents live over in Lakewood. And so we'd get them to hop over the mountains and come visit us in Delta every once in a while. And so uh, we are ga gathering support for them. And also for my good friend Stan Slade. Stan has been with American Baptist uh, International Ministries for many years. His role is to go and teach people how to study the Bible real easily, just in a simple way. Now, we have Bible study teachers that are a part of this church. Some of them are active right now leading Bible studies. Some may be inactive. Uh, they're just in a Bible study and they're not teaching. But we want to continue to equip the body of Christ and that's why I said to Katie and to Haley and to Mary and, and to Bonnie. Bonnie's already using her gifts. She's been around here for a long time. Uh, using her, her gifts as part of the Board of Christian Education and Sunday School Superintendent. She also has the gift of hospitality. Boy, she can make some pretty good vittles. If you eat bon invited to her house or there's a potluck, Bonnie always brings good stuff. Uh, but we want these other ladies and also the two guys that we baptized, uh, Dave Bray and his grandson, Nathan Taylor. We want them also to be equipped and to discover their gifts and to grow in the Lord. That's what my friend Stan does with people around the world. Rick and Anita work in the context of the missionary to do whatever they can to help equip 
the church for good works and doing ministry. And that's what we all should be seeing. It's God, what are my gifts and how can I use them? How can I put them to work for your glory and for your honor? So think about that and, and take time to support these missionaries this month as we're raising support for them. Uh, we also, let's see, Vicki already told you about next Saturday, but I think it would be great if we had, you know, 100, 150 people show up for the ordination service. It's really a way that we can show support to Laura and to Mike and their family. You know, many of you do, that Mike's been going through some really serious health problems. He's just 50 years old, and he's uh, had cancer already in his lungs. There's a possibility of it coming back. I know it would encourage their hearts to see this place filled up, supporting them next Saturday afternoon. So don't be a forgetful here, but come back next Saturday at 2 o'clock and be a part of that ordination service. It's not going to go all afternoon. Uh, it's just going to hit, hit some high points, and we'll have some of our out-of-town uh, pastor leaders that will be here as well, and it'll be a great time to just encourage and support them. Uh, as I think about that, also we've got, you know, Larry Wallace in the shoot is working towards ordination with American Baptists and uh, which every step of the way we just continue to take steps of faith and watch what God is going to do there. And so uh, just encourage you in that. Uh, today, oh, I guess it's time for Children's Church. Are there some children and leaders ready to go upstairs and uh, enjoy a time of Children's Church? Go with our prayers and our presence. And uh, Children's Church workers, if you've got any uh, scallywags that are up there uh, causing chaos, uh, send them back down and we'll have them walk the plank here at the church, okay? All right. Uh, good to see everybody in the house. I do see some first-time visitors here today, and I'm so grateful for that. Friendships and... Uh, Continuing with the Lord. We're going to uh, open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 to the Sermon on the Mount. And we, what do we call this sermon? The best sermon ever. Because Jesus gave us this sermon, this word. And we're going to look at peacemakers today. But uh, before we open up the scripture, I think I got a picture for you that we can put up on the, uh, on the slideshow. Um, what this is a picture of is a peacemaker. In fact, <laughs> some of you may own one of these. Uh, you don't have to raise your hand. But this actually is an 1873 edition of a Colt 45. It had a long barrel. Uh, I don't happen to own one of these. In fact, I'll let you know, I don't even own a gun. So uh, come on in my house, you won't get shot. Oh, no. I do, live, I do live with my daughter and granddaughter, and I think my daughter has a concealed carry. So uh, watch out uh, when you come in. But uh, this peacemaker, uh, it was a Model P made by Sam Colt. And it says, God created all men, but Sam Colt, made men equal. And so that's why since it was a Model P, uh, it, it became known as the peacemaker. Well, uh, today we're not going to be talking about Colt 45s other than just as an introduction to the message. Uh, beyond that, we're going to, uh, we'll know that uh, the peacemaker was used by Wyatt Earp. In fact, it was given to him upon his resignation in, by the grateful people of Dodge City. Uh, so that's something close to my heart. He took it, of course, to Tombstone, and you probably know the rest of the story if you've watched any of the different movies about that. But uh, peacemakers are people who bring peace, especially by reconciling adversaries. And in God's word today, as we look at uh, verse 9 in Matthew chapter 5. It says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Sons of God. So what is a peacemaker? Besides that revolver, it's a person who brings about peace, especially by reconciling adversaries. 
These are people who actually bring about peace and overcome evil with good. And we need these kinds of people around the church. Oh, there's no conflict in church, is there? You've never heard of church people arguing with one another or, or throwing up their hands and going home and taking their toys with them. Uh, no, it couldn't happen there. But in our country, all we have to do is turn on CNN or Fox News or Newsmax. I don't care where you get your news from, but you will find there is conflict in this country, in this world around us. And yes, it does even come in and invade our own homes. In fact, last night I was called up by a family in conflict that the mother has moved out and taken, taken her son with her and left the father at home. And my prayer is this morning, uh, God, reconcile this family, reconcile this couple, bring them back together in love, and help us to be the peacemakers that can make that happen in their lives. And so as we look at this verse, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God, I want to remind you first that you will be blessed if you are a peacemaker. If you are used of God in any way to bring about peace between disputing parties, you're going to be blessed for that. That's good news. The end of the verse is good news as well. You're going to be called sons of God. It means you're going to be like God, his characteristics, because God is a God of peace. Now you might say, now wait a minute, pastor, I've read the Old Testament. It seems like that God's people were always making war, doing battle, that they were uh, aggressive towards their neighbors. They didn't really love their enemies like it says later in the Sermon on the Mount. How can I reconcile this God and you say he's a God of peace? Well, God is a God of peace that desires that we follow him and reflect that into the world around us. And what God was doing was taking a people that he had called his own, making them a people, bringing them together in unity, and then setting them on uh, an acreage of this place called planet Earth and giving them a promised land where they could live at peace and peace with their neighbors. Now, it did not surprise God when he was doing this that there was conflict. God knew and understood that, but he said he would be with his people and just as he was with the children of Israel, he will be with his church because Jesus said he will establish his church on this foundation and he would be the chief cornerstone that would carry the good news, the gospel into the world. Speaking of the gospel, we're reminded in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 15 that the gospel that he shods our feet with is called the gospel of peace. When we take the good news into places where they've never heard it before, where they, it's to bring peace not war. Although, you're, if you're in Matthew chapter 5, turn over to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, I just want to show you what Jesus said in verse 34, Matthew 10, 34 and following, it says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. Now, that's interesting. Jesus is known as the Prince of Peace. Isaiah foretold that 800 years before Jesus was even born into the world. And now Jesus, as the Prince of Peace, says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
What is God saying? What is Jesus saying to us other than we need to love him more than any other relationship that we have? I remember as a young person reading, going across that scripture and looking at it and it's like, God, what does this mean? Uh, that we're going to have conflict in our households? And that's one thing that when we are living according to the world's ways, the world's standards, and a new standard comes in and we desire to live according to God's standard, it's going to throw chaos into your relationships. It's going to throw chaos into relationships within the families. Uh, need I go any further than say, take a, a Muslim family that one of them comes to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Oftentimes, you'll find that family will disown that individual. They will disinherit that individual. They will push them out and they will not consider them to be their child anymore. But doesn't that happen here in America too? When somebody gets genuinely saved by Jesus and they start living for Jesus, they have friends or they have family members that say, you're not the life of the party anymore. You're, you're not so much fun to be around. All you do is just talk about Jesus all the time. And isn't there some of that division that happens right here in our families too when God gets a hold of us in our life? Now, it doesn't have to be that way, but Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but I'm bringing a sword he wasn't talking about like the peacemaker, the gun, you know, or a, a real sword, but he was coming with the truth. He is the truth. And the truth shows up in the Word of God, and it's called the sword of the Spirit. And so God's Word does its work. It, it, it does uh, surgery on us and, and cuts out of us the worldly ways that we used to follow when we start to follow the ways of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so a as I go through this message, uh, those of you that picked up a bulletin might find that there's a place for sermon notes that's completely filled out except for a few blanks. Now, I know you can fill in the blank, you do puzzles and things like that, but you might want to use the answers which the author of that outline put together, and so I'd love to give that to you as I go through this message. For those that don't have a bulletin, I'm sorry, but I hope you will hear from the author that I have listened to so that he will speak to your heart on how to be a peacemaker. In fact, I can tell you of all the Beatitudes... This is like my almost favorite one. Uh, I love what came right before it. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I've always tried to strive as my goal to be what the pure in heart was. I can remember one evening, Vicki and I had our home group Bible study over at our house. And uh, one of the participants says, you know, Pastor James, you're something, you're something. That, that, what is it, what is it? And I, I said, I, I'm innocent? And he says, no, you're naive. <laughs> so once I heard that, I wanted to hear more. Um, I'm naive? Yeah, yeah, the things of the world. You're, you're, you're naive to the things of the world. You know, you were brought up in a Christian family, in a Christian home. You grew up in the Midwest on a farm. Uh, you weren't exposed to a lot of the social ills of society. And I thought, well, that's okay. You know, I have a colorful testimony in my own way it may look black and white to you but but uh, I don't need to go out and color a testimony just so I'm not naive I thank God for that protection that he placed placed over me as I was growing up now there were times when I was growing up where I wanted to be more worldly but God held me back and I'm thankful for that especially since I became a follower of Jesus um so this peace is also known as shalom. Shalom is, uh, means wholeness. It means making something complete. Now peace is not just the absence of conflict. Uh, 
I don't know what I did with my bulletin. Oh, there it is. It's underneath. Uh, it's not just the absence of conflict, uh, because it's also the presence of something that is fulfilling you, wholeness. It completes you. Um, shalom is the Hebrew word for peace. It means wholesome or making something complete. So as we look at this peace that Jesus is talking about, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God, we need to know that before we can become peacemakers, I think the beatitude that came before, we need to be pure in heart. Because if we're not pure in heart, then we're going to go into any kind of peacekeeping mediation uh, and we're going to be skewed by our own desires instead of being just sold out for what God wants out of the situation. Um, if we can become people who actually bring about peace, who overcome evil with good, we will fulfill what God has called every one of us to be who are followers of Him. First, though, we must surrender to experience peace. What do I mean by that? Uh, well, there's a war that we are welcome into when we come into this world. Now, I heard that one of the young people, uh, Libby's granddaughter, had her baby this last week and uh, brought a little baby boy into the world. And we got another one coming into the Conley family sometime in the next week or two somewhere. Uh, but when you are born into this world, um, there is some conflict just being born, isn't there? I don't have to remind mothers of that who've given birth to their child. Uh, there is a lot of work. And there's conflict going on. But once that child is born into the world, there's even more conflict that can happen in their lives as they grow up and there's a conflict within the heart of every one of us until we surrender to Christ as our Lord and Savior. Uh, we fight against it. We, we push against it. Uh, we test God. And even sometimes after we've already accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have times in our life where we get angry with God. We resent our lives and what happens. We wonder why he left us without our life partner, husband or wife, leaves us as a widow. Maybe we wonder why those kids that we, born in, we, we gave birth to in the world, why those kids turned out to be rotten apples. Uh, what was it? You tried your best and... and Part of that is the influence of our children doesn't come just from us as parents. It comes from what's around them as well and what they take in. And how many hours are our children taking in stuff that we don't even check it out. We just let them do it. Um, uh, need to watch some of those things. But there is conflict or sometimes we face conflict and we decide... The best way to deal with conflict is to sweep it under the mat, is to avoid it, to glaze over it or pretend it's not there. Now, the prophet Ezekiel talked about this. You know, he didn't have a lot of friends when he was being a prophet for God because he was speaking the truth from God's word. And a lot of the people were living a different way and they were not receiving his words. But in Ezekiel chapter 13, you find a story of where Ezekiel is scolding the, the, the religious leaders. And he's talking about how they are so clean on the outside, they're like whitewashed tombs. They've, they've had a makeover, they've had some paint go on the outside, but inside they were dirty and they were unclean, and they were just doing their own works instead of doing what God wanted them to do. And he was raising it up so the judgment would come upon them so that they would turn from their wickedness and repent and turn around. 
And isn't that oftentimes what happens when we go to worship, when we hear the message at church, there is a sense of God bringing conviction on the change we need to do, and sometimes we just walk away from it. We leave unchanged, not wanting to give up the pleasure of this present generation. And so we don't listen to what God's saying to us. But God will not bless a people. He will not bless an individual. He will not bless even a church that's in conflict. I am thankful that that for the most part, we've had our times, but for the most part, since I've been pastor here at this church, we haven't had like major conflicts that have caused trouble in the church or in individual families or in our whole community. There's been upset, but uh, if you even talk to the average person on the street in Delta and say, uh, Delta First Baptist Church, what do you know about it? Uh, What will they tell you? Oh, those people. (laughs) Those people. (laughs) No, I think we have a pretty good reputation, although we're not trying to earn a reputation. Uh, What we should be about is bringing glory and honor to God. Uh... Hopefully, what we would hear is, you know, they're a lovely bunch of people. You know, they're, they're, they're kind and they're good-hearted and uh, they are at work. I, I can remember when I came here as a young pastor uh, in the profile envelope that I was sent, there was uh, a, uh, like two or three pastors in town were asked by the church what do you think of First Baptist Church? And there was one pastor, and this really helped me, put me over the top, say, God, is he, are you calling me here? Because there's one pastor here that said, I think they're too much in love with their building. They don't get out in the community enough to do the work of God. Uh, you might go, oh, but I was so thankful, first of all, that the people who were members of this church didn't pull that and not let that be in there. But somebody they didn't even know, they allowed that issue uh, that was brought up to be in there and uh, it it told me there were people that were really want to be honest and 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 what we've tried to do is to get out of the walls and not just stay in our comfort zone but press out into community and live life fully but we can only do that as we surrender and experience God to experience the peace which God has for us Um, the second thing that uh, we share, we share the gospel of peace with others. Because the Great Commission is not a suggestion, but instead a command. A command. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, Jesus commands his disciples, not just those guys that were standing on that hill and ready to watch him go up into heaven, but he commands all of us to go. Make disciples. But we do it in our going. We don't do that in our sitting. We don't do that in inviting people in. We go out to make disciples. We make disciples of all nations. So people of every tongue, of every tribe, of every nation and country will be followers of God. And we get to heaven, we're going to really experience what church is like. And all the diversity of God's full family and uh, guess what? When we get to heaven, uh, it's going to be a beautiful thing. Uh, I can't wait. Well, I will wait. Uh, I'm not going to get in a hurry because <laughs> I can see me getting up there too early and God say, you've got 30 years to sit in, out here in the waiting room before you can go in. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, uh, but I do want to fulfill the Great Commission. I want to be a part of a church that fulfills the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, uh, but also teaching them. It goes hand in hand that we teach and help one another grow to be more like Jesus. And so this Great Commission, uh, we will find that uh, as the blessedness of the pure in heart comes before the blessedness of peacemaking, there's a reason for that because God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, I have a verse in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.18. It probably will be up on the board, but I just want to read it for you once I find it. 
Well, I can just read it off of here. Read it with me. Oh, nope, that's Matthew 5.1. Do we have 2 Corinthians 5.18? Maybe we don't. I got it right here because it says... Okay, read it with me then. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. See, with that word right there, reconciliation, the R-E, re, means you're redoing something. You may be remodeling your house, repairing your car, re inventing the wheel, which I wouldn't suggest that, uh, but it's something that you are doing. And then conciliation, conciliation is uh, counseling, uh, but conducting ourselves, coming alongside and reconciling, bringing together those who are apart from one another. And reconciliation can be a very thankless job. Uh, third, it's thankless, it's a task, by, but rewards are stored up in heaven. And I put in this interesting statement in the notes, friendly fire will kill you just as much as bullets from the enemy. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. See, God has made us his ambassadors for the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And once we cross over and surrender to him and enter into the ministry which he has for each one of us, he invites us to be these ambassadors that go out and share the truth but also bring reconciliation. It's inviting God's other children into his family. It's also going out when we get together with the Catholics or with the Methodists or with the Assembly of Godders that we're not in conflict with them. We may be coming from a different position in the body and the family of Christ, but we're all teammates and we work together to build up the kingdom of God. And, and it's, it's important that we recognize that. We're not trying to make everybody into Baptists. Uh, God has his people in every church around town where Jesus is Lord. Now, there are some churches around town where they don't serve Jesus as Lord. And they shouldn't even be called churches. Uh, but we need to be able to identify ourselves and be able to go and interact with them and be those ambassadors for Christ. That raise up Christ, we don't raise up our denomination, we don't raise up our individualism, but we all are part of the body of Christ. Um, as I said earlier, it's a gospel of peace which God gives us. By spreading the gospel, we help people to come to God. We are born into this world as enemies, as sinners, but God, through those who share the gospel with us, make peace between man and God. But there's someone out there trying to cause chaos. You know, the devil made me do it. That devil's a troublemaker. It is God who loves and reconciles people together, and we can overcome the enemy. Mm. Uh, I believe that as we make new believers like Katie and Haley and Mary that came up here today, that it is also our position to help them not only become believers, but sharers of their faith. To be able to go and share with others what it is, why they made the decision that they made. Uh, we are to go and and in a simple way, learn how to share the gospel. Uh, and we are planning, we are planning to have opportunities for those women and those of us to come together and know how to share the gospel in a simple way, in an unthreatening way, be able to just say, uh, say you're down at uh, City Market and you see someone you know, but they don't go to church, maybe one of your neighbors, and you uh, say, hi, neighbor. Uh, has anyone ever shared the gospel with you? What's their answer going to be? 
go away? I haven't heard that when I've asked that question. Sometimes I've heard, yes, they have shared the gospel with me. And I say, yeah, tell me, what, what is the gospel to you? Uh, or they say no. And then you just follow up with them and say, hey, could I take a minute here just to share a simple plan of the gospel with you? And find out how, oh, I'm in a hurry right now. Well, then when, when can we get together? How about I come over, you come over to our house and we'll have some cookies and we'll have some milk and we'll just share it together. Just a way of sharing. You know, it's the good news. Is there any better news than the gospel and what Jesus has done for us? No. And why is it that almost 98% of Christians do not share the gospel in a consistent way? Are we ashamed? Are we worried about rejection? Are we more concerned about our public appearance than standing up for Jesus? I think there's a verse in here that says, if you deny me before man, he's going to deny us before God. And so take every opportunity to share the gospel. And, and we're called to peace. All through the New Testament, you see verse after verse where we are to have peace in our marriages. We are to have peace in our families. We are to call the church together in peace. You know, there's been conflict, though, from the very first family. See Cain in Genesis chapter 4 and his brother Abel. That conflict is carried down to every family, every individual, all through time. Now, the root cause of conflict uh, is probably the sinful use of our tongues. You know, our tongues kind of get their, get their leading from our brains and our feelings. And should we go just based off of feelings? Sometimes conflict happens. I was in a group meeting yesterday, and a couple of guys were asking for prayers because... It seems like uh, when you send a text on a group text, uh, there's going to be somebody in there that says they don't want it anymore. I had that happen yesterday. I sent out a group text just about, hey, men's fellowship happened at the church 730 this morning. And I got a text in the afternoon, take me off this list. And it's like, oh, OK, I'll do that. There must be something that hit wrong. It was the same individual that the week before uh, had uh, an issue and left our group early and so uh, didn't want to be part of it but it's also the same one that said hey pastor can we get together sometime and talk about this you know so something's going on in that individual's life there's a conflict there but I have an opportunity to go in and find out is the conflict with me is the conflict with the word of God is the conflict in our style of how we approach the study of the Bible and to sit down and be able to work through it. See, oftentimes, God wants us to reconcile the conflicts between us and another individual or another group. And we have a hard time uh, separating ourselves from that because we're emotionally entangled in it. But sometimes you can ask somebody else to come in and help you with that conflict, mediate through that conflict. But God wants us all to be peacemakers, not just some. He invites us to be the peacemakers that are at work within the world, within the church, within the family. Um, let's see how we're doing. Uh, I want to bring up to you that uh, the problem with the tongue, uh, Proverbs 15.1 says uh, that we should give a gentle word in the face of conflict. We are to... Uh, try to come in and change the hurts and the resentments to where God can enter in and to work peace. You know, an, another part of becoming a peacemaker is we must start with ourselves. Sometimes it's common for us to live in denial, to say, oh, I don't have any jealousies, any conflicts, any trouble with anyone else. But we hold on to envy, we hold on to unforgiveness, and it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to get sick. It only infects us. In Romans chapter 12, verse 14, we are told to bless those who persecute you. 
We are to bless anyone who mistreats us. Later on in verse 18, it says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with one another. So God wants us to live at peace one with another. Uh, to be a peacemaker means turning from self-interest to seeking the best for others. It's getting our eyes off of ourself and how we've been hurt, but how we can seek the best good for those around us. And I'm even talking about those enemies, those, those that have put you down. How can we uh, raise up and offer an olive branch to them other than a fist, other than, you know, a... Uh, 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 an all emoji filled uh, capital letter text that we send back to them, which I think the capital letters mean that you're really upset, you want to make your point. Uh, I don't understand all that for sure, but how can we uh, be a peacemaker and take the intensity, take the pressure out of the situation by not avoiding it, but meeting it with peace, with love, with kindness, with patience, the fruit of the Spirit which God gives to each one of us. Sometimes we have to set our own feelings aside. And we have to divest ourselves from that. Jesus, when he was praying in the garden the night before he was arrested, right before he was arrested, he pleaded with the Father in his prayer, remember? Lord, if there be any other way, let's find it right now. Let's, this is my paraphrase. Let's, let's get to the bottom of it. Let's, let's try a different plan. But then he said, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross in his humanity. But in his divinity, he was willing from the time he left heaven to come to earth to take that cross for you and for me. Because he knew it was the only way to bridge the gap between man, sinful man, and God, holy God, was for him to become that perfect sacrifice. And he did it through the power of the cross, through the power of his life hanging on the cross. There were those who were mocking him while he was hanging there dying. He could hear them. They were within ear's reach. He said he saved others. Why, cannot he, why can't he save himself? Because he was doing the ultimate gift of peacemaking. See, God's greatest act of peacemaking came when God took the cross in place of humanity. When he, he died for me and he died for you. As we remember that blessed are the peacemakers because they shall be called sons of God, children of God. They will be able to, and they are we, we will be able to not only see God because we're pure in heart, but also be named with the sons of God. And is that really one of the goals before we get out of this life? that we have our names written in the book of life, that we become children of God, not in rebellion against God, but the joy of the Lord is our strength. He is our deliverer. He's delivered us. He's offered us eternal life through Jesus, his son. As I go to the conclusion of this message, I want to take you to some scripture in First Peter. Remember, Peter was the one that opened his mouth more times than not and stuck his foot in it. Peter was the one who denied Jesus three times and Jesus came to him in his resurrected body and restored him by asking him, Peter, do you love me three times? Peter's the one that had the audacity to ask Jesus if he could get out of the boat and walk on water and he did until the winds and the waves got his attention he started to sink. Uh, Peter was, was the one that Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. Now, just because Peter's name translates to Petra, which means rock, he was talking about on 
the foundation of everything Jesus had given to Peter and the other disciples. He's going to build his church. And he sent those 11 guys out to spread the gospel. And they've done a pretty good job. And others after them. And we need to take up the mantle and do so as well. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18, we are told, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. What? Yes, when Jesus came, he didn't do away, abolish slavery in the Roman Empire. It was there. But what Jesus said is be the best slave that you can be, whether your master is a good master or whether they're a scoundrel. He said, for this is gracious, a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. We may not have a slave master for us, but we do have big brother government. We do have uh, all kinds of bosses that uh, oversee us. And the best testimony we can have as followers of God is to be gentle whether they're a good master or not. Now, how many of us this week have sinned by complaining about the government? How many of us this week have, have, have said under our breath some things about the boss uh, or about those around us, even in our own families? God, forgive us. Help us to be peacemakers. Help us to reconcile those around us. Peter went on to speak through the power of the Holy Spirit in verse 20, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. See, you know, if you deserve the beating because you've sinned, that's one thing. But when you do what's right and what's good and what's honorable and still take a beating for it, are you able to... Button your lips. Are you able to just take it like a man or like a woman and not speak evil towards those who are persecuting you? And we'll get into that here in a few weeks. Uh, blessed are the, those who are persecuted and kind of round up this part of the message. But here it says, uh, going to leap forward to verse 22. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Can our eyes, can our vision be so focused on the cross of Christ that we could put in, say your name. Say your name is John. We'll put in here, for John committed no sin, neither was deceit found in John's mouth. When John was reviled, John did not revile back in return. When John suffered, John did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to God who judges justly. You could put Sally in there. Yeah, you could put two in there, or you could put Ma in there. Help us to reflect to the world that we don't have to get even, we don't have to get revenge, but we want to reconcile parties that are dead set against each other and sometimes that's ourselves. Sometimes that's us in our marriage. Sometimes that's us in our workplace. That we could be peacemakers. Not just peacekeepers, but peacemakers. To bring peace, bring shalom, bring not just the absence of conflict, but the wholeness which God has for us into that place. Let's pray. Lord God, reveal to me and to those within the sound of my voice where we have wanted revenge, maybe we've even gotten it and found how, how false it was. Reveal to us when we desire our own wills to be done, even if it's in conflict with your will. Help us to seek 
to bring peace into relationships all around us. And God, let your shalom fall down on your church. Let your shalom be here bringing wholeness. Help us to be made complete in Christ and to be named with the sons of God that we are yours and you are our Lord. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Let us leave room for God to do the work. Let God to be our shield and our protection and help us to be his ambassadors reconciling a lost world through the gospel of Jesus Christ in relationship to God our Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.